This episode is being brought to you by Diesel Fuel Prints. Diesel Fuel has been in the sticker business since 1991, and he's been printing all of my stickers since the early 2000s. Dieselfuelprints.com always uses the highest quality weatherproof material, full color printing, 125 black and white stickers starts at just $25, and easy online ordering at dieselfuelprints.com will get you a quote on sticker of any shape and size you can think of. Shipping's always free, and listeners of this show will get a 10% discount if they use the promo code AWP2021. So go check out Diesel Fuel for your sticker needs. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Anyway Whatever podcast. I'm your host, Mike Fisher, and today's guest is artist, illustrator Jay Ryan of Bird Machine, um, Jay is a rock concert poster artist, art prints, screen printer, things like that. We talk about how he got started. Super nice guy. We've been friends for a long time, and he's one of the coolest, nicest people I know. Uh, anytime I get a little time to sit and talk with Jay, I'm, I'm always very happy. Um, another episode where we were talking, and I liked what we were talking about, so I didn't stop to do an intro. So you just come into it uh, with us talking about his band. Um, you can find the links to all of Jay's work down below in the description where you can also find the uh, links to our merch store and our Patreon and all of the other details about the show. I appreciate the support I get from everybody on this show. It continues to grow, you know, faster than, <laughs> than I keep thinking it's going to slow down and then it doesn't. Um, anyway, I'm going to get you to this episode on the other side of this. <laughs> Are you uh you playing music at all at this point? Uh, I'm not at the. I'm not. No. Uh, no. there's an <laughs> ongoing. <laughs> well, there's an ongoing project with a a, a a one specific friend of mine. Um, and we're just it's it's go it's like a kind of concept project where we're just going to get everybody we love to contribute stuff to it. Um, and it's uh it's a grindcore band. Uh, that all the songs are about Jean-Claude Van Damme movies. <laughs> I mean, is that like, like, aren't they all already? <laughs> well, there is a thing at Grindcore that's kind of like, like there's a band called Charles Bronson that like has like, you know, it's like there's, there's a lot of that that goes on in, <laughs> in that genre. So, um, and so me and my friend Nelson are doing that. And then we're just like, it's just like an all-star cavalcade of like heavy metal and like hardcore punk musicians who are like, as soon as it, like we mentioned we were going to do it, everybody was like, I want to, I want to contribute guitars. I want to I want to I, I sing on it. I want to do something. And so it's just going to be this massive, you know, probably be like 30 songs that are under a minute long. And like all of our <laughs> friends will have a part. It's going to be really cool. It's actually the music like the scratch tracks are all like a bunch of the scratch tracks are done. And I basically need to just start laying vocals on and figuring out where, but you know, that means I have to watch a lot of Van Damme movies. Cause I got to come up with a lot of lyrical content. <laughs> that's uh that's, I mean, that's the kind of thing that'll get you out of bed in the morning. That's, that's great. Yeah. It's and really I haven't funny. had to do vocals in like a decade. So I'm a little terrified of it to be I'm honest. starting to, so it's starting to heal. You're starting to get heal and uh, be ready to shred it again. Yeah. Yeah. That last band was, uh, it was fun. Yeah. My last band, DIS, I got to see the whole world. I got to see most of the world with like my best friends. I couldn't have asked for a better like four years. It was really good. It's like one of the main, one of the main reasons to be in a band. Is, well, yeah. I mean, certainly not for the money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Between that and just all the getting rich all the time, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's I, just like yeah. nonstop party yeah. people no i just i <laughs> you know this band has taken me all around the country all around europe seeing all the corners of europe that that uh you're not going to see if you're just like hey i'm going to europe and i'm going to go and look at the eiffel tower or something you you know like you get to see all these uh you know stay at people's apartments and uh and go where they go to get breakfast and uh i don't know yeah, yeah it's, that's like half the reason to be in a band is get to do that stuff and meet people through that. So. Yeah. I mean, when we played in Budapest, like 
the the apartment building that we stayed in is like older than the United States. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. 400 year old apartment building. I was like, holy yeah. shit. Yeah, uh, you don't, it's just shit you get in Europe that's just, you, it's just a completely different level of understanding about history than you, than mm-hmm. you can get in the United States because we're still relatively new here, you know? It's like, it's crazy to you know, think. Yeah. It's like shit in the Czech Republic that's like a thousand years old. And you're like, what? Oh. How is that? How is it still standing? Please <laughs> come on. In America, if anything's older than 50 years, it's time to tear it down and redo it. Down, yeah. <laughs> Tell you the place in Budapest, they weren't tearing out the short wall between the kitchen and the living room. No, so they, they were. They know that's a, that's a <laughs> structural uh, yeah. load-bearing wall. Call yeah. back to what we were talking about before. Probably didn't record <laughs> that part. <laughs> true, oh. true. Yeah. Anyway. No context now. <laughs> um, so, Talking with Jay was fine, but he's weird non sequiturs. I don't know. He's talking <laughs> about rehabbing kitchens. I don't know what he's talking about. So. Uh, you know, um, uh, sometimes when I'm doing this, I uh, like I, you know, like I do like a proper like, hey, everybody, today's guest is Jay Ryan, blah, blah, blah. And then sometimes like I'm having a fun conversation and I just let oh. it roll and that becomes the episode. So that was all really fun and interesting. So I'm just going to keep that and have I'll just I'll just do another intro before we even go, because this is this is a nice conversation with my friend Jay Ryan, who I haven't talked hey. to in forever. Yeah, no kidding. Hey, I gotta. Something's been bugging me for roughly, I don't know what, ten years or something like that. And it was the last time I saw you at South by Southwest. And mm-hmm. I remember you, you had, you like came in as a surprise. And I don't remember what I was doing. I was like on the phone or something. And you came over and you're like, "Hey, I'm here." And I was like, "Yeah, hold on a second. I don't remember what the deal is. I was, I don't know what it was. I was, it was something stupid. And I was always like, ah." I always felt like such an asshole for not being like, throw the phone in the toilet and, and <laughs> yeah, no. go grab Mike. But well, uh, first of all, you know, I'm not the most important person in the world, and if you had something going on, it's totally fine. And I totally don't remember. So if it's been wait. if it's been staying with you for ten years, then it's been with you for way too long. <laughs> I don't know. You you know you get those faux pas from seventh grade that stick with you, mm-hmm. and you're like. Mm-hmm. Oh, I wish I hadn't said that in 1985. You're like laying um, in bed at two in the morning, and you're like, God <laughs> damn it. Well, anyway, yeah, several sleepless sleepless nights worried about uh, having uh, been rude to you uh, roughly 10 years ago. So, well, you can let it go now. You you can let it leave your your mind space forever. (laughs) But I appreciate it. I appreciate you caring enough about our friendship that it bothered you. That means a lot to me, actually. Thank you, sir. So, um, so in, uh, just for the, for the sake of, uh, you, your name is Jay Ryan, and your main thing is the Bird Machine, and you do Correct. concert posters and art prints and stuff. Um, and when when did you start Bird Machine? Because it was already in existence, I believe, when me and you became friends. Maybe yeah. not for very long, but certainly it was. So let's see. My I got into screen printing uh, late in '95. Um, a buddy of mine named Andy Mueller uh, was running a small. Uh, design company here in Chicago called the Ohio Girl Company. And I was doing a lot of spot illustrations for him and doing illustrations for friends' bands and my own band and designing t-shirts and doing a little ad for, you know, a little quarter page ad for the, the back of this or the other, this, that, or the other magazine. And then um, Andy got a job illustrated, or uh, sorry, to make a poster for Rocket from the Crypt, Super Suckers, and Wesley Willis fiasco playing at the Blind Pig in Champaign, Illinois. Wow, and <laughs> that's a lineup. <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah, a little, uh, little bit of everything in there. So um, he asked me to do this illustration for it, and then he laid out some text. And um, he had a history of screen printing T-shirts in high school uh, at a at a real or in college, I guess, at a real print shop. We went over. We heard about this screen printer that was working a couple blocks away from us, named Steve Walters at Screwball Press. And uh, so we went over and met up with Steve. Uh, Steve printed these these posters, um, and but he and I sort of hit it off. And slowly, I started working there uh, over the winter '95 into '96. So I worked there with Steve and learned how to print uh, for about three years. And then he was losing the lease on that space and moving into a much smaller space. And I had access to a basement uh, at my place where I was where I just moved into. 
So I decided to start my own shop in January of 99. Okay. And uh, so I started in January 99. I wasn't sure what to call it. Um, I wanted it to be something that's sort of uh, abstract and sort of not overly specific because I didn't know if it was going to be, I didn't want to be like J Ryan rock concert poster company. You know, I wanted <laughs> it to be like, you know, something that was, um, cause I didn't know if like five years later, I was going to be like just designing book covers or designing sure. websites or running a daycare or a bakery or what. So <laughs> I wanted it to be like something that could be flexible. Um, I read a book at that point by a uh, author named Haruki Murakami called the wind up bird chronicles. That was where my head was at. And I, I just sort of that idea of like little, you know, little toy bird tin thing that you, that bops around. Oh, so, shit. Hold on. Uh-oh. It's time for utility time. Yep, anyway, there we go. keep so going. Was, I'm sorry. That was the, that was how the name came about. And, uh, yeah, just started in my, in my basement basically in like, in like a 10 by 15 foot space with six foot ceilings. And, uh, <laughs> and you're like the, six foot five. <laughs> the pipes were, <laughs> how old are, how tall are you? Are you I'm six, three, six, okay. three. Yeah. yeah. you Still though, um, <laughs> it's tight space. I'm six three, but I float two inches off the ground. So it's, yeah, it does. It looks like six, five. um, but anyway, yeah, the ceilings were reasonable, but the pipes were all at six feet. So I'd hit my head. That's what happened. That's what this is all about is <laughs> from hitting my head, um, too many times in the uh, four years I was in that space. So I feel like somewhere deep down, I knew that you started with Steve Walters at Screwball. Um, and then I'd forgotten it until you mentioned it, but yeah, Steve, it, it, that seems, Steve seems to be the Chicago guy that gets a lot of people going or or historically has i don't know if he still is doing stuff i know he used to do classes and all kinds of stuff and yeah steve's steve's a good dude he's a grumpy guy but he's a, a really <laughs> really good dude <laughs> yeah i'm gonna see him this week he's um so yeah it was um what steve did was and the thing that's really valuable about what he did is that he created this space that was just like handmade equipment and like it was all like plywood just taped together and a bunch of springs from the hardware store and string. And it's a total pirate ship of a, of a pile of junk, but he made it work. And he had, he built like this little community where there was a bunch, there were a bunch of people, let's say six or eight people that were kind of the home team who would show up there at random hours to, to pull prints for their own bands or the clubs they worked at, the you know, clubs they're attending bar at or whatever, or running the lights for. And, um, and uh, it was real, you know, a um, lot of give and take technique, a lot of give of um, like sharing supplies and stuff like that. And uh, having that community was like such a great way to learn to print. And uh, I was, what was I? I was uh, 23 when I got in there and I thought, I thought Steve and, and Bob Hartzell, I thought they were really old cause they were 33 and I, <laughs> I couldn't believe that they were still able to, you know, have their arms work to pull the squeegee cause they were 33. Good Lord. So anyway, um, yeah, yeah I, I think when I met Stevie was like, maybe he was over 40 and I was like, woof, man, yeah. this guy's still in the rock and roll game. He's a, yeah. he's an old timer. Yeah. Look at him go. <laughs> yeah, no, he's not great right now. So yeah, he's he's uh, he just expanded his shop. He's got a happy, you know, nice little setup a couple blocks from his house. He's uh, hand pulling and hand pulling large volumes of stuff. So um, he did, uh, I think, eighteen hundred pulls yesterday or the day Jesus. before. And uh, yeah, his biggest bummer of the week is somebody stole the stem off his bike. And uh, I saw that. So, yeah, I've got a stem. I got to get to him. So. Uh, I saw I saw that and I was like Jesus Christ this is like the most Steve Walters <laughs> yeah, Facebook post hand. possible <laughs> to like, oh, what bad Sam thing happened to Steve. <laughs> yeah, I know like I uh, was like it's like every day you get online and it's like what what bad thing happened to Steve today <laughs> but <laughs> but he, he actually looks like he's doing really good and like it's yeah. it you know one of the things that's the friendships that we all got through the rock concert, uh, you know, community. And it's just like, you know, getting like the last 20 years of just being able to get to see people, uh, see their lives evolve, you know, like, you know, mm -hmm. we all knew each other in, in a certain context. And then over the course of time with social media, like a, a lot of us stayed friends and it's like, you know, you see people's kids like 
graduating from high school and going to college and graduating from college and getting married and having kids and all this stuff. And it's like, it's pretty cool. Like people talk a lot of shit about social media, which they should, because there's a lot of negatives, but, um, I think if you frame it, I, I, at some point I started looking at Facebook as, um, like a scrapbook, Mm -hmm. It's basically a scrapbook where you can like, you know, you can check in somewhere and it keeps it in the map. So you can always go back and go, Oh, I remember that time I was on tour and we went to this, you know, French fry place in Belgium and it was super killer. And, you know, there's a picture attached to it. And like, you can really treat it like a, like a scrapbook. And I think if you're good enough or it matters enough, you can weed out a lot of the shit, negative shit from Facebook. And so personally, because I've worked for myself and you know, you know how it is. Like you're, you know, when you were a freelance or self-employed artist, you get a lot of alone time. Mm-hmm. And so for me, like if I want to talk to anybody, like other than my wife, who's on set a lot, like, you know, I have to do it online. And so, you know, yeah. I've had well, to totally tailor my Facebook experience to be tolerable. Yeah. But I mean, a lot of people like in your shoes and my shoes, you know, some people go to an office and have a group of, friends or coworkers that they interact with there mm-hmm. you and i i mean i sit in this space you're sitting in that space and like you want to i don't know the other part of it is we have friends around the world you know mm-hmm. we have friends that you're not going to run into going to the coffee shop on the corner you have those right. friends also but you know you want to know what's up with pivoto or you want to know what's up with you know anybody else you know having the social medias and being able to be like, Oh sh- shit, his daughter turned four or whatever, you know, like, that, <laughs> yeah. or, Oh, uh, it's cool that he got to see, you know, he got to see his Bobby last week or whatever it is, you know, that's, that's what this stuff is for. And it's, uh, um, I, you know, I, I don't shape my life around it, but I, I love the fact that I'm able to check in and be like, Oh, Hey, friend from high school who I don't really ever see, but, glad to see your kids out of that your kids graduated eighth grade you know whatever yeah yeah uh, yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. that's great so we're not we're not we're not uh inventing any new huge philosophies here it's just uh <laughs> it's i appreciate that, that sort of stuff is so easily accessible at this point yeah for sure it uh you're you really only print your own stuff right like you're not a print service like you don't print anybody else's work or whatever no not really i have some your former- wife maybe sometimes uh she's she hasn't made posters in years she's been really um she's fully fully engaged in the children's book illustration situation she hasn't done a a screen print in uh a long time but uh um i have some former i have a former employee who is a really really good printer and runs her own uh print shop here in chicago um out of the her paper hat gallery um and uh but no, I don't really um, don't really print other people's stuff. Um, have done it, you know, for friends now and again in the past. But um, sure. that, that's not. Uh, I don't know. I figure I've got. <laughs> I've only got so much time, uh, and uh, I got to kind of be careful about what it is that I commit to to sure. make sure that the stuff that I can do that's I'm like, doing the best I can. Sure. Um, during the during this pandemic, like you know, did you find yourself, uh, able to do well with art prints or, cause I know a lot of artists and people I know, like a lot of rock poster artists were like, I just started taking the band names off. And like, I found I was still selling the same amount of pieces. So something like that. Yeah. I mean, I had, I really only lost a couple of jobs, um, that got, uh, sort of postponed or, or a couple jobs that got printed, you know, uh, finished printing first week in March. And then, the can the events got canceled uh before they shipped so i've got i've actually got some prints here that you know there's 500 waiting to be uh used at some point but um i mean a lot of what i did last year was either stuff that uh just sort of art prints that were not specifically like oh you get an inner i got an internet unstable message there for a second Um, you're back it's all good they were not specific okay um i was doing stuff that was sort of uh themed on 
I was making art prints, I should say, that was sort of themed on, um, you know, take care of yourself, take care of your community, uh, uh, stay home, like be responsible sort of themes. Um, I made these, uh, this text print that said, I will hug you in the future. I will, um, other ones that were just like, everyone's alone together, you know, people sitting, uh, little characters in their windows talking through, um, tin cans and twines, but out of their res uh, trying to, um, I lost you there for a second, you know, focus on sort of the more positive aspect. Oh shit. I'm sorry. No, it's totally fine. The reason I came so to the shop, so. Totally fine. Uh, trying to focus on sort of the positive aspects of, um, yeah. of that whole weird, stupid experience and, <laughs> uh, and play weird. those up. And, uh, and in a way that wasn't like overly specific, but more just like sure. take care of your friends, kind of, you know, something that's yeah. broader sort of message. So, yeah, um, I saw, I saw then, some of those and those were, those are really cool. There was, those are really super cool. Thank you. But then, then, uh, like then the online, concerts started and the the front yard you know the porch concerts started and i don't know i probably did four or five posters for like internet tours you know uh so i didn't expect that to be a thing but um or like zoom you know uh whatever online concerts yeah. so um that was that uh kept me busier than i would have guessed so. That was a that was an unexpectedly cool thing that popped up. Like you know, leave it to. There was a few things that came about d because of directly because of the pandemic in the entertainment industry. Um, the one of them was people doing you know online concerts, and I was like, I thought that was like, you know, it's like the you can't keep the spirit <laughs> of of rock and roll down for very long, you know, and it's like. Yeah. Um, and then the other one that we were getting in LA and I, I, I don't know that I saw too much of it going anywhere else, but it had to have been, was these like drive through experiences. Yeah. They did one here in LA that we went to that was for the TV show, stranger things. Oh yeah. And it was like, you would drive like the, the, the entrance way was like the entrance to the mall. And then like you drove up through this parking garage and it was like, you know, all scary stuff. And then it, on the rooftop, they had it all like laid out with all these like LCD panels. They no like, ran through this whole play, like kind of reenactment of the show. And there was like people on wires, like flying around. It was, it that was awesome. so cool because it was like, somebody was just like, there's a way to exploit the pandemic and make something yeah. cool, you know? And it's like, you can stay in your car haunted house. That's, that's awesome. It was, yeah, that's exactly what it was. And then there was another one out by us that was just like this crazy, like, electric light like maze that you drove through and there was like people on stilts and all this stuff it was really yeah there was like a bunch of stuff in la like that and i thought it was i thought that was very cool that's very i love cool. stuff like that we had nothing nothing like uh nothing quite like that we had we did have my family does this family we've got this family tradition we go to the this arboretum that has this big holiday lights thing we go there you know mid-december every year and uh it's usually this walk you know through the snow and lights and laser shows and all this stuff and it's really really nice but uh yes yeah, so we did a drive-through thing for that they they created for this year but uh not quite the same but uh <laughs> still pretty fl you know them trying to be flexible and and make up something new but you know it's no stranger things parking garage but <laughs> yeah that was pretty really neat. what is not much i mean you know uh you know, I just, I guess that just kind of, for me, it's like, I, I love when people make lemonade out of lemons, I guess, like yeah. just as a, as a creative person, you know, it's like, even if it isn't something that I wouldn't particularly be interested, even though I, I did, I was interested in the stranger thing things, but it's like, you know, just when people can't be contained, I, I love that kind of stuff. And people are like, you know, like my artist friends who like almost in almost to a person was like, dude my career went through the roof because everybody was home and they, you know, like people were just buying art like crazy. And I was like, that's amazing. Like you just never know 
you know, it's that whack-a-mole. You never know when, when one thing pushes something down, what's going to pop up the other side of it, you know? And, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm glad That's, to hear you stayed at least a little busy. Yeah, no, it was, uh, I mean, it was a weird year, you know, you got a, you know, fourth grader at home at the kitchen table. Uh, oh. Diana is, has, uh, working on the other end of the kitchen table and she's got a full load of, of her, uh, children's book illustration stuff. And, uh, I'm trying to split time between working at home and working over here in the shop by myself. And um, yeah, it was a weird year, but I, you know, it's, so many people had so had it so much worse, but uh, we're, we're pretty fortunate to kind of be able to wade through and, and be, uh, be flexible and all. So I like seeing that from a lot of friends. So I, I, I felt the worst for my friends who had like school age kids like that just seemed just brutal, like just yeah. brutal having like, Cause you know, kids at that age, they're, you know, they're so full of energy and like just trying to make them stay in front of a, a, a screen. Yeah. I, I can't like, I watched a lot of my friends just like losing their minds over how much that was, how hard that was. And it was like, I get it, man. Like I would have been, <laughs> I would have been a nightmare if I was put in that situation when, when my kids were all in grade school. Junior yeah. no, high I mean, can like, you imagine, like, I've, I've asked this question of a bunch of people. Can you imagine this whole thing happened in like 1983? Oh my God. There's like, no internet. Yeah. Like what you, you get like a, like a folder of mimeographs dropped off at your house Monday night or Sunday night or something like that. And that's your workbook for the week. Like, I, I guess that's I, I, how it would have been. No idea. So our schools was straight up canceled. So anyway, uh, yeah, we survived. Uh, daughter's getting ready to get back into school here in the next week, go to fifth grade. So yeah, go back I to see school that in person. Too. It's weird. So, yeah. Have Your you seen it? Have, all, my kids are all grown ups. Like 20, right? Yeah. My, my, my boys are 30 and 32. Wow. I yeah. know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. They're like buying photos. Houses of them. And I can tell I, there's a slight, slight family resemblance to you like you can tell it might be related uh, yeah and, then, and if, if you see pictures of my like there are pictures of my dad when he was a teenager and pictures of me when i was a teenager and it it they, we look so much alike it's it's insane and then my two boys are the same way yeah and my daughter's 27 28 in uh you know she 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 had just finished nursing school and had just gotten her first job with Kaiser, wow. like literally right when the pandemic started and she ended up in a COVID testing center. So wow. like she was like front line from day one. And that was wow. fucking terrifying, man. That yeah. was so scary. Like just, you know, and yeah, she's getting was, healthy the whole time though. Yeah, she, yeah, she didn't get sick at all. Nice. She didn't get sick Excellent. at all, and uh, you know, it's it's crazy. It's like, you know, it was it's it, it, like you said, it is like a weird year and a half, and it's like we everybody got like you know one of the things about the pandemic that I thought was funny was around the end of the year, people were like, oh, you know, this is the second wave, and I was like, no, we never finished the first wave. And now we're getting the second wave and people are like, what's happening? And I'm like, yeah, well, you know, people weren't realistic, but at this the same time, you know, this is nowhere near done. Yeah. You know, yeah. but I mean, we're vaccinated and we're, you know, we've, we've been model citizens this whole time until my birthday in July, when everything in LA actually opened back up, we didn't, mm -hmm. hadn't even eaten in a restaurant. We didn't order food out. We cooked at home. We just tried to be the best citizens we could. And, yeah. uh, and so like to have the rug pulled out, like right when we were about to like start having like some shit we could do during the summer, we were pretty annoyed. <laughs> yeah. Well, as I've said before, the world just needs more Mike Fishers uh, setting an example. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about all that. <laughs> <laughs> You're not so. to ask my kids about that. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, um, yeah I, what you else? know what? Uh, one of the things that I don't know if I have, if we've ever discussed uh, it or if I'm aware of is, did you go to art school or are you self-taught or what, how did, how did you end up being the illustrator that you are? That's a good question. Um, the big story is I, I went through high school thinking I was going to be an architect. So I took, <laughs> we could actually take drafting at my high school. I remember, so I same. Four years of drafting. 
Uh, and then uh, I applied to some colleges uh, for architecture. I ended up getting into, I ended up going to University of Illinois in Champaign. Um, but I was not a good enough student in high school to get into the architecture program. So I started in industrial design. Um, you know, still all the drafting and, and all that and um, getting into AutoCAD. Um, yeah. Started that. And as I like to say, I got halfway through the first semester and realized I didn't really didn't like the work we were working on. I didn't like the, uh, the other kids in the program and I didn't like the faculty. So there was a cute girl in the painting program. So I changed to painting. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so I got a degree in painting. Um, really? And, do you paint still? Sporadically. Like I'll sit down and I'll do, you know, a handful of paintings, but not, I would not call myself a painter. Have I ever um, seen any of your paintings? Like, do you ever show them really or anything? Cause I, I, I'm not, I, I'm not, it's not coming into the memory bank that I've seen Jay uh, Ryan paintings. They, they look a lot like <laughs> the, the prints, uh, the screen prints. Um, but the, they're not going to be a big surprise, but you know, a lot of dinosaurs and, um, squirrels, dinosaurs and <laughs> space capsules and, uh, and, uh, uh, bears and stuff. But, um, Anyway, so I, you know, I, I need, I was really happy to get into screen printing and out of painting, um, sort of when that transition was made, like a year, you know, a year or two after I got out of school. So, but yeah, uh, painting degree, um, more than, I don't know. I mean, I'm certainly not a, like a painter. I don't, really have much in the way of technique or anything like that. But um, as far as the, the creative process, um, some of the, the uh, thought processes that I learned uh, stakes, um, those are, those are things I carry with me, you know, right. You know, and, um, and I appreciate uh, that whole experience. So anyway, um, that's, yeah, that's just sort interesting. Of, that I, I, the more artists that I talk to and the more I ask like, Hey, did you go to art school or what'd you, you know, tons and tons of people do not make the type of art that they went to school to learn <clears throat> like tons. The guy whose yeah. episode is on, um, this week, which is, uh, middle of August. Um, he wanted to be in special effects. And so mm -hmm. the school near him where he went, it was like, it was also industrial design, but he thought he was going to learn how to make molds and do all this stuff. And then it wasn't what he wanted. And so it, I just keep hearing from people like, Oh, I want to be, you know, a printmaker and now, now I'm a painter or I went to be a painter and now I'm an illustrator and like all yeah. these different, like once you get done with school and you get out into the world, uh, it, I think it, it's oftentimes ends up, you find, find something that you like to do more than what it was you were trained to do. And and, yeah. and and you can draw from the things that you learned in other disciplines into, you know, what it is that you want to do. Like you were saying, like your paintings are very much like your illustrations and your screen prints. And so it doesn't really surprise me too much, actually. I think part of it also is that when you're 20, I mean, like, how are you supposed to know with re few exceptions, like not really supposed to know very specifically what it is you want to do. I mean, I wasn't about to accidentally become a veterinarian or a lawyer but like i you know i didn't really you know the job that i ended up with that where i am now like didn't really exist that wasn't like an idea that you'd be like oh you know what i'm gonna do for a job is i'm gonna draw goats and and that'll be the thing i do it's gonna be great um you know it's like do i want to be like a medical illustrator or like should i be doing renderings of buildings or like what you know, uh, so I, I think, you know, I, I didn't know really sort of what all the options were at 20. Um, but right. you know, you kind of, you get that skill set and, uh, you figure out how it, how to adapt it to wherever you land by the time you're 25 or whatever. So, yeah, I that's, mean, that's the hope anyway, <laughs> it goes right. So anyway, yeah, that, or else, uh, you learn something else entirely. So. I also have a shockingly large number of friends who wanted to be architects and, and immediately were like, no, nah, I don't want to do this <laughs> and like kind of bailed out of it. Yeah. One of my good friends who 
as an adult, like in his thirties was like, I'm going to go to architecture school. And he got like, he got way further in than you should wow. before he figured out he didn't want that. He didn't like it. Like it was kind of the same thing you did with the industrial design. He's like, I don't like any of these people. I don't like the course. I don't like the teachers. <laughs> I like, I don't like that. They make me work like 80 hours a week when I'm in school. Like that's how my life is going to be when I'm mm. an architect. He's like, I don't get it. Like, why are they treating us like doctors? You know? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know. Uh, well, <laughs> it's just, yeah. <clears throat> happy that I, happy that I made some of the decisions that I made and, and, uh, wish that I'd, uh, started out wanting to be a doctor. <laughs> Have you ever done any children's books, illustrations? Your illustrations are perfect for it. Have you ever done any of that work? It seems um, like you'd be, you'd kill it. Not that have carried through. Um, no, I, uh, thank you for your compliment, but no. Um, yeah, the couple things you, you would think looking at my work, you'd be like, oh, Jay's probably done a children's book. No, Jay's probably designed a skateboard at some point. No. Oh, uh, that's a shame. Uh, I don't know. There's, yeah, there's a lot of things that you kind of think that I would have gotten to do at some point, but just hasn't panned out. So, um, anyway, uh, yeah, I would like to, um, I've, I have had this, well, I'm not even going to start in on that. I've had this, this <laughs> character and this sort of mini story that's been kicking around in my head for, uh, well over a decade at this point that started to show itself in those, um, those notebooks that I made with field notes. I'm trying to see if there's one here. It's a story of this, uh, this bear, um, who comes upon a, a uh, who's the captain of a, a flying boat is the simplest version of that. So um, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to finish up that whole universe someday before I die, but uh, it's still, <laughs> I got up again today and still didn't work on it. So, um, yeah, but uh, that came out and started to, started to get some of that story out in, uh, uh, you know, a book that I went, came out with field notes a couple of years ago. So, anyway. yeah, I mean, now, um, nowadays in the day in, with self-publishing, like you can just be like, I'm going to do this, <laughs> you know? And like, yeah. it's kind of nice. Like there's a lot of stuff like about our modern age that is frustrating, but then there's a lot of stuff that's like, you don't need a record label anymore. You know, you well, don't, you don't need a, a TV network to give you your own TV show. Like you can, self-publish your own trading cards mm -hmm. books get your own youtube mm -hmm. channel and suddenly you're, you could be a star you know it's it's crazy it's i mean that's for better or for worse that's like an amazing part of just access to information and access to the internet and uh i, I mean you know you you take us back 20 years like i don't know if either you or i would have been able to have our jobs you know, without internet access, uh, oh, as far as yeah. like, people, you know, being able to <laughs> communicate, being able to get hired by bands who are just browsing posters and they come upon your stuff, you know? Yeah. And I mean, a hundred percent, a hundred percent of my business uh, for 20 years has come from the internet directly, mm -hmm. you know? And it's like, I switched over to doing merch design because the merch companies saw my posters on gig posters and they're like, well, why don't we just hire you to do this same thing on t-shirts for all of our bands. And that's yep. how I made that switch over. And it was easy for me because I was tired of having inventory and, you know, like one run of posters, you, you know, you do a hundred posters and you sell every one of them in four days. And then the next posters even better than the last and you yeah. sell like two of them. And then you have yep. like 180 posters sitting on, I got totally tired of that, but, um, I actually wow. just designed a screen printed rock poster for the first time in a long time. Whoa. Uh, yeah. With Richie good times, no less. We kind of cooked. Excellent. I, I did all the illustration. I basically, I did everything. And then Richie took it and was like, I'm going to now make this better. And then he, he like if Richie good times did into something from a design standpoint that I would have never came to. And so that was cool. That was fun. So there might yeah, be good times posted that. the corner of some image that was like a pile of skulls against something. Is that, is that the thing he said? I'm, 
no it makes me happy or something like that, that was a couple weeks ago no uh, that was a t-shirt for the same project uh it's okay. for this music festival this will come out after the festival okay. happens but right. um he did a bunch of shirts for it and i did uh it was supposed to be like one poster and then we ended the design i came up with they decided to cut it into four pieces so because it's a four-day festival so that there's one giant poster or you can get four individual pieces um and yeah and that's like yeah the reason i was happy is because richie just spent the last what seven years being an auto mechanic instead of Mm -hmm. you know being what he's on earth to do (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's that's correct i mean that's exactly correct i mean that that guy i'm sure he's a very good mechanic but uh he should be he should be uh he should be making screen prints he should be uh, terrorizing uh, people with, with with his with his work which he does yeah. a good job at yep so I'm, i was happy to see him uh getting back into uh getting getting dirty again so yeah for sure um, yeah uh what was the tangent we were about to go down a second ago? Having the, a senior moment here. Hold the, on a second. The books. The books. I don't remember. Um, it was something after that. Uh, uh, we're going to talk about how great the internet is. No, that's not it. Um, <laughs> all right. Next question. Let's go. Well, we're moving on. <laughs> well, you know, we were, you were kind of mentioning like about like YouTube and stuff and like having your own channel. One of the things that, that I fig- figured out um, over the pandemic was that, YouTube has all these amazing art shows that people make on their own. And it's like, everybody gets to be their own Bob Ross if they want to. And it's like everything from like young kind of urban artists that do paintings, or even there's like graffiti guys, there's, Mm -hmm. you know, design shows. Like there's all these art channels on YouTube we can just pe- watch people make art. And some of them are so amazingly well produced that some of them became my favorite TV shows. Like I, wow. there were, there was like probably like four months over the, over the last year where I didn't watch regular, like I didn't watch Netflix. I didn't want, I just watched stuff on YouTube and I found all YouTube these amazing videos. things. And it was like, that looks fun. I want to try that. So I've been kind of working towards my own YouTube art channel. That's awesome. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, here's, here's an observation, uh, about your work, um, from it, my inside of my internal brain. Uh, when I became familiar with your work, one of the things that seemed to me, even though your work does not look like this person's, I, I always felt like maybe there was uh that Derek Hess was kind of a an you know an influence on you absolutely I I feel like the colors a lot of the colors and stuff that you use like kind of came from I mean you guys' work couldn't possibly look different well you know but does that you're you're absolutely right I mean uh what Hess was basically one of the first like concert poster like his body work was some of the first stuff that I really kind of became aware that posters were a thing that were people were doing. Um, I was really attracted to it. I would, in college, I'd been really into uh, this Viennese secessionist painter, Egon Schiele. Mm-hmm. And so I was, you know, I wrote papers on him. I, you know, I he really informed like how I drew figures. And I think Hess also pulled from Schiele's uh, sort of style uh, and so, see, so yeah, I really connected with Hess's work. Uh, number one, like, yes, the colors um, and uh, the sort of the dirtiness of it, but also just like the gestural aspects. I was talking about this actually with early, earlier today with somebody else. Um, like, I learned a lot of drawing from literally look like from drawing skateboarders from Trans World Skateboarding Magazine. You know, I like they very much informed my idea of like how the body moves. You know, you're looking at Pessoa doing a judo air or or Hawk tucked into a a 540 or whatever. And the way that shoulders are in relation to the spine and the way that this arm is flailing like this, you know, and can you see the thumb or is it like this or, Mm -hmm. or what, um, like that awareness and, and, and sort of the, 
you know, you've got all these healthy, skinny guys with where you can see very clearly the muscle, you know, it's twisted this way and you can see this bulge on the arm here, like that being able to understand the physics of these, these bodies sort of out of gravity. Um, and then, so have coming from that and then finding Egon Schiele and then finding Derek Hess and Hess is so much about the drawing and about the, like, you know, the, the working into the line work and stuff back. We're talking like 94, 95. And then the bands that he's working for are like working on, or a lot of, you know, what I'm listening to. So, um, I felt like a really good connection with, with, uh, with his work. And that was, you know, one of the, one of the main inspirations for my work as I was getting into, um, into screen printing. Um, we talked, trying to see if I've got yeah, here. I don't have an, a copy of the actual print here, but we were talking a minute ago about that first job that I did with, um, that Andy Mueller got me uh, that was printed at uh, Screwball Press. That was this one here. That was very much, you know, the yeah. gesture, the character is all, you know, you're not going to mistake it for Hess at all. It's <laughs> but, but you're also but, not going to mistake that it comes from the same place either. Yeah. So, so that's, um, so yeah, Hess is, uh, Hess is a, a, a Definitely an inspiration. Um, later on, I got to meet him. I got to hang out with him. We traveled in Europe a little bit together. Um, and uh, I'm just happy to see that he's still making work and uh, cranking stuff out. Yeah. I mean, Der Derek and his manager, Marty, like, I, I mean, I don't think I, without their support, and I don't think I have the career that I do at all. Like, it started becoming a thing where Derek was too busy for certain things. And then he would just tell Marty, like, see if Fisher wants to do that. And so I would start getting jobs that were meant for Derek Hess <laughs> that were coming to me. And I was like, Oh, that's dumb. But at the same <laughs> time, I'm like, you know, I got some really huge high profile, like work, mm -hmm. you know, for like, you know, metal bands and hardcore bands that I, I mean, that I just, I couldn't have reached those people in any other way. And so I, I owe them, I owe them a lot, a lot. And, uh, you know, Derek was always really, really cool to me and, and Marty too. And so I've got, you know, obviously nothing but good feelings about, about all that stuff. And, you know, like, you know, for me, like the, the, the influence on the poster thing, you know, came from like a few different places. And there was like, you know, I was working in Santa Monica and there was like a, you know, record store head shop on the third street promenade mall. And, can't remember what it's called pyramid air imports or something and they sold rock posters and you know this is probably 96 97 mm -hmm. you know and it was like you could go in there and be like there's a kozik poster there's a hess poster there's a taz poster and there's a chantry poster mm -hmm. and all four of them are could not possibly be different <laughs> in yeah. in style from each other and so it yeah. was like you know that's when i i remember seeing that stuff and just being like there's so many possibilities in this particular art form. Um, and that's when I kind of just decided that that's what I wanted to do. And Mike Murphy had already started doing some posters himself. And so he was sending them to me, you know, and I was like, dude, I want to do these too. And so I just, you know, kind of found a way to do it. And then, you know, wound up on gig posters and the rest, you know, the rest yeah. is history. Wasn't, basically. wasn't gig posters started as, a collection of your work is not my work thinking? specifically but i was one <laughs> of the very first people to have work up on there like i okay. just got an email from clay one day like mm -hmm. out of the blue and he's like hey i'm starting this thing school like a college project to like archive cool flyers from shows and mm -hmm. stuff like that and like i saw, saw on your website you have a bunch of like punk rock flyers and some some you know posters like can i put them up and i was like yeah sure man and like that and so I was like, you know, one of the first like four people in the message board or something like That's that. Awesome. And then I like, you know, I was like, oh, this is dead. There's nothing going on here. So I like bailed. <laughs> and then I checked back in like six months later and I was like, oh, there's like some active users. And so I just stuck around and, yeah. you know, like El, Magni El Negro, Mag yeah. Magnifico, Phila Arts Day. Yep. Yeah. Like I think the three of us were like 
some of the first three guys rake like on a daily basis, you know, kind of checking in. And then it just, you know, I feel like, I feel like once Kozik showed up and was regular daily, shit mm-hmm. started blowing up mm-hmm. on gig posters yeah. and then Chantry showed up and then, you know, yeah. and then, I, you know, it's crazy. Uh, before I knew him, Pivoto emailed me and said, Hey, there's this site. They've, somebody's got your work up there. You should check it out. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I don't, whatever, you know? And then, uh, I didn't, you know, I was, uh, this is during like a year and a half. I was working at a, at a college sort of helping run the computer lab and, uh, and then printing over, you know, at night at home. And then, uh, and then Alan, uh, El Negro Magnifico uh, emailed me basically the same sort of thing. Like, Hey man, we've, we've, we're over at the site. There's this, you should check this out. And that's what got me in, into gig posters. I want to say that was the fall 2000, I think, but um, I think it was like right after I got married and, uh, and had my, like an office job basically for (laughs) about a year and a half. So I feel like uh, one of the things that I seem to remember and, and I don't, I don't know if it was specifically can be, you know, kind of pinned to you, but I feel like you were one of the first or the first person to start doing a subscription. Um, I don't, I don't remember anybody else having a year subscription like you did where it was like people could sign up for this amount of money and they would get every print you did for six months or a year. I don't know if I'll, I don't know if I can say that I was the first, I don't know if there were, other people in our community doing that um during the let's see for about five years in the 90s like 95 to 99 maybe uh my girlfriend diana was uh the master was a a printer at uh, a chicago artist named tony fitzpatrick's it's tony tony fitzpatrick is a chi- chicago printmaker artist painter guy who's a big character here in chicago um she worked as his printer uh and he offered subscriptions to his work and his his work is like much more expensive and everything but um he had uh much uh sort of li- larger clientele and a sort of this this uh big success story this guy who'd been stealing cars and landed in the hospital and and like drew some um like little chalkboard slates, basically, as I understand it. And somebody said, Hey, those are pretty good and gave him a show of them. And Jonathan Demi came in and bought them all. And then that sort of was the kickstart to his career was his first gallery show, as I understand it. Anyway, years after that, Diana's working for him. And she mentioned that he had these subscriptions. And uh, so, I mean, it makes sense for some people, you know, that we all we all know, like, sort of those very nice completist kind of people who (laughs) they might not be into everything, but when they find something they like, they kind of want all of it. And so I've been very fortunate with a bunch of people who um, have had patience with me for years and sign up, get some, some amount of money at the beginning of the year. And then uh, which is a massive help to my, my overhead costs. Sure. And then uh, they get, uh, you know, they end up with a, a bunch of work at the end of the year. Some of it's, you know, exclusive to them, um, to, to the group of uh, subscribers. And some of it's just like, um, you know, I got to make a Jack White poster and you don't need to worry about whether you're going to click the link at noon to be able to get your Jack White poster because there's already number 35 from the edition sitting there waiting for you. So, um, right. so that's, uh, yeah, so that's something that has worked out. Do you still do a subscription thing or do? Yeah. Wow. Nice. I do. Um, So I've got 40 spots. uh, I'm finally doing my 2021 uh, spreadsheet right now in August, which is. (laughs) Um, I think everybody should be willing to be forgiving of that type of thing. If the last 18 months. (laughs) But yeah. So, I mean, um, usually end up with a, you know, a, a couple of open spots every year. So I've got two spots open right now, but, um, I haven't really sort of announced that. So I'm hoping to get those filled, but, um, yeah, it makes sense for, you know, it doesn't make sense for everybody, but it does make sense for people who are already wanting to buy, you know, 
half dozen dozen prints over the course of the year and uh sure. you know some of them though just not so into this print you know, now you got something to give your nephew for christmas you know that sort of thing so, so. totally man yeah, yeah that was definitely one of the good things about being a poster artist you always had gifts for people <laughs> yeah uh, um yeah and um you know that's one of the things looking back at like more of the the flat stock heyday like I've tried to pare down my collection. I've still got 15 drawers full of other people's work that I love. And like, I don't know what I'm going to do with all this stuff. Cause it's like, I'm not going to get rid of, you know, like, I don't know what, I, pick a name like Jesse Ledoux. I'm not going to get rid of my, my 50 just Jesse Ledoux prints, but like, I'm also never going to like, they're, they live in a drawer, <laughs> you know, like, what what do i do with that so um for sure dude so, I, I don't like, know. the only posters that i've left is i have like a few of most of mine for like the retirement fund mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then i just have i have stacks of other people's prints that you're right like there's probably five or six pieces that at some point i'm determined to have framed and put mm -hmm. up and yeah. Like I have, I have five pieces of mine that were in the Grammy museum that they paid to have framed. Yeah. Otherwise I've never framed any of my art ever. And so yeah. like they're the only reason why they're framed and hanging in my art studio is because the Grammy museum did it for me. Uh, but like, yeah, like, dude, I have so many rad rock posters and it's like, wow. what am I going to do? Wall space and, and like, yeah, not, you mean, know, not enough money to frame them. And, you know, it's just like there's a million, you know, like this one I love, but like, it doesn't go with anything. And know? then you've got like the good associations of knowing, you know, the folks who made those things. Yeah, you know? I remember them handing them to me or whatever, you yeah. know, you know, it's like, yeah, yeah, man. Yeah. Um, yeah, I wonder if flat stocks will come back and when South by comes back. Well, they're I mean, they're doing the one in Chicago here in, in another what in September. Um there it's it's still going on um i'm not going this year because i don't have much in the way of actual concert posters and there's sort of a quota as far as sure proportion concert posters but um well who is gonna be, have <laughs> you know what i mean like well, there hasn't been concerts <laughs> who's gonna be able yeah, to i don't build? know i'm uh i think it's also still like a little early to be uh involved in a festival of whatever it is fifteen thousand people but um Hopefully that all pans out. Uh, we had Lollapalooza here in Chicago a couple weeks ago, and apparently mm -hmm. that went there. Like there was no spike in in uh, hospitalizations after that. So yeah, I you know nothing I'd love more than to be uh, going to all the different flat stocks and and seeing people and selling a bunch of work, but uh, it's not going to be this year. So yeah, I mean maybe maybe if it happens again at South by maybe we'll we'll go just to go see everybody because we're due a trip to Austin anyway, and that's like if you a, could a party you walk away with some extra money from I mean that's just a good time. <laughs> yeah, I mean you know it, it was never my audience, so I never at any of the flat talks I never sold enough to even pay for my trips, but they were always worth it anyway. At least the Austin trips, like Seattle, like. I made, I think I sold like one poster the entire time. So I never went back to Seattle. Me. Well, Bumbershoot, like none of the bands well, at Bumbershoot are, the fans are, you know, they're not looking for death metal posters. At no, no, but I mean, right? Austin though, I, I, that's a surprise to me that you wouldn't be killing it in Austin. So, I mean, I think uh, there were some years where it was like, I, could, I was like a break even, like I paid for my, my plane ticket. And because I always stayed with Connor, like I never had mm -hmm. a hotel bill. Um, so, I mean, I think I did okay with those. And again, like the, the Austin ones were always way more than worth it because you know it's like you get to see everybody all at one time you know yep yeah yep, yep. crazy crazy awesome. world of rock posters and all of the people that it brought into our lives it's pretty special it's pretty special yeah. and you know finding a community like that and being able to so interact with those people you know over years and uh that's that's pretty great so i wish i hope that uh, people in all sorts of fields would get find that sort of situation for themselves. Yeah, and and you got to wonder if it if it popped up now, like could it happen again? Because you know, it's like it happened in a message board, and message boards aren't a thing anymore. Yeah. Um, although there is 
a um you know are you familiar with the painter Chet Czar? He's like kind of know. the the big you, you've have hundred percent seen his work. Everybody on earth has seen his work. Um, he spells Z A R. Sorry. And uh Z A R Chet Czar. Oh, okay. okay. Um he created a Facebook group for his podcast called the Dark Art Society. Okay. And it is basically gig posters, but for people who do like, you know, dark horror goth type of art. Um, yeah. And it's fantastic. And it's like crazy supportive, um, like gig posters was. And it's also crazy, like, you know, <laughs> you know, weird chemistry. And like, you know, they every Friday they do this like live stream where mm-hmm. everybody just live streams into Zoom what they're working on. And because it's international, it goes for like 12 hours. It goes oh for God. like five o'clock on Friday evening until like five in the morning. And it's like just people go, coming in and out and painting and like talking. And it's, it's insane. It's like the only other community I've seen that is as functional as Gigs Posters was. And um, I'm going to find yeah. that. Yeah, Chet did a ton of stuff for Tool, which is one okay. of the reasons why you may have seen some of his stuff. Like he did like a bunch of their videos and because he was like a special effects guy, a sculptor, and he got into 3D stuff. And when you see his work, you'd be like, oh, yeah, I know that guy's stuff. <laughs> it's like he's like the, the most pronounced dark art guy, uh, you know. Uh, good dude. Yeah. Good dude. There's I was on his smoke. podcast and he was on, we did like a cross promotion podcast where we on each other, like we recorded one episode and we each put it out. And that, oh, nice. that was really cool. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. I, I kind of, um, I follow a bunch of stuff on Instagram. That's like, I can't think of the actual usernames now, but like, just like, you know, like Cthulhu imagery, just like, just like, uh, just like some, you know, rotting gods stalking through the woods sort of stuff. And I was like, I wish, like, I wish I had that in me. Like, <laughs> I, love, I love that sort of, that For sort real, of stuff. Man. This oh, is I sort get of like it. Outside my, outside my experience. But, um, but yeah, that's, uh, to be able to, uh, to be able to sort of pull that stuff together is just blows my mind. So. I absolutely love Instagram for, like just checking out art and like what young people are doing and what Mm -hmm. styles are now. Cause it's like, you know, I still do a lot of merchandise and I still have to kind of keep my eye on like, what do kids want to see on their favorite band's t-shirt? And um, so, you know, it's like, there's a, you know, I kind of try to keep track of all that stuff and there's the volume of quality work that is put on Instagram every single day is Mm -hmm. staggering. It's staggering, like how many good people there are, and it's staggering like, and super humbling. Just like, holy yes. crap! How do you make that? You, I, okay, how do you compete? Yeah, <laughs> especially okay, as an so old white guy. <laughs> NFTs aside, like I've been following people for for forever, and like, like how do you fucking make one of those images or those animations like within twenty four hours? Never mind every twenty four hours, like that that sort of stuff. Like that, um, yeah, that, that level of work, uh, just done so quickly, just completely blows my mind. I'm sitting over here with pencils and like, I'm literally drawing like a, a, a junk truck that collects metal, metal in the alleys, like Sanford and son today with a pencil. And, uh, <laughs> I'm like, somebody else would be done with, you know, done with this as an animation by the time I get to drawing the fourth tire on the truck. So. Do you still work analog with a, with a lot of your process or do you still, do you do separations in the computer? Like how are you still? So I did for a long time. I was known for, you know, drawing in pencil, maybe inking, maybe uh, photocopying films for uh, like overhead transparencies on a photocopier, taping those together and then cutting Ruby lift. Um, I got, uh, I came to my senses at some point and uh, started <laughs> taking the pencil drawing and scanning it and, um, and then uh, doing my separations in Photoshop. So that's how I do most of my stuff still. I still do a handful of things with Ruby Lith a year, but um, probably 90% of the stuff is, uh, is um, there's a bunch of teenagers walking outside my window here. Sorry, I just wanted to <laughs> see 
Get out of my lawn. Get off my lawn. Um, get off my sidewalk. <laughs> get off my sidewalk. There's no lawns like, in Chicago. They're like six feet away from me. I could stand up and like scare the crap out of them. Anyway. Um, oh, oh, Chicago, sir. I'm not in Chicago. I'm in the confusing, strange suburb of Skokie, Illinois. There's no. Oh, here. You, okay. It's weird. I, it's a weird place. There's a lot here. And yet you can't say like, oh, yeah, I went to Skokie for. You don't go here for things. It's, it's a how good far place. Is it, how far is that from Chicago? Uh, 15 minutes. It's, oh, okay. it's very close by. I mean, technically, okay. I think no, well, it doesn't quite actually border Chicago, but yeah, we're, we're on the, on the edge. Um, anyway, uh, what was I going to say? Oh yeah. So at this point now, yeah, most of my work is done. Um, uh, <laughs> remedial Photoshop, uh, layers, uh, <laughs> do the coloring literally on my trackpad. I don't even use a mouse. Um, so yeah, my wife, uh, Diana spent two very frustrating weeks a couple of years ago, getting herself into procreate mm -hmm. and, um, and is now just a master of, uh, doing what look like great watercolor paintings, uh, in procreate. And I still have not, gotten off my ass to teach myself that skill she was she was doing this because she uh has started doing all these these children's books and illustrating these books she would do what basically amounted to she if she had to do like 20 or 30 paintings she'd do 20 or 30 complete paintings and then turn them in and the art editor would come back and say well this is great but can we make make that the shoes blue or can we mm -hmm. add an extra rabbit and she'd start over and do another complete painting that was a finished painting. Um, and it was really frustrating to see and watch because she's working so hard on these things that other people are just like, yeah, it's good. Can you make those trees shorter, you know, or whatever, whatever the critique is. And um, so then she, you know, she tore her hair out for two weeks learning procreate, but then she's just so good at it and, uh, and really doesn't need to do actual gouache paintings until She's really in the, in the final stages of stuff. So, um, so that's been satisfying to, to see. And, uh, I, at some point I'm going to have to learn, sit down and take, take the time to learn myself. Yeah. So. I went digital about five years ago and I kept telling myself, I, I was like, you know, you're still going to draw. You're still going to mm -hmm. draw, but it was like the, for the same reason as, as you're saying, like, you know, if I have to do an album cover painting, they want it to be an oil painting or a gouache painting or a watercolor painting, like, if I do it digital, like I can just fix it. You know what I yeah. mean? It's like, there's no like send it in and it comes back and you're like, well, there, I guess I'm painting this over again. Yeah. Like you can just, yeah. and then like the tools are so insanely accurate now that like mm -hmm. you, most people wouldn't be able to tell a lot of the stuff is digital. Um, and you know, but once, you know, once I, once I got the actual Cintiq that you actually draw on the screen, mm -hmm. um, that was it. I, I have not drawn on paper in like five years. I don't think I've drawn anything on paper that wasn't just a sketch while I was on the phone or whatever on paper oh, in like five years. But, you know, it's like I have, you know, I still have 20 years worth of drawings from projects that are useless. And I was like, why? Why? I don't need it to do this anymore. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Yeah, I mean, I'm... Yeah. I'll get there eventually. I just, uh, I mean, you know, however it works for anybody, I, you know, still like the, still like the actual, the pencil, you know? So I but, feel you. I understand. Yeah. I get it. And, and, and I talk to people, some people still totally analog, some people fully digital, some people hyper digital, like you just, you know, you never, you know, what, however you get done what you need to get done, you know, like, I mean, I don't think anybody should judge when it comes to creative stuff. I think, judgment should be uh very low <laughs> on, 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 on you know and it's like process wise yeah I, you know i see that sometimes when people like too fussy about how something got made and i'm like why do you why do you care first of all and second of all like you know somebody made something and it's cool like just be happy about that <laughs> you know like yeah. uh, 
Yeah. Dude, this has been a fantastic conversation. I'm so glad that you that we managed to get it together. Like we there was a lot of rescheduling between the both of us <laughs> as life is what it is. And um I'm glad we were able to get it together and do this. It was really it was really good to see and to talk to you. And um I know you were a little worried about um how much content we'd have and we just totally knocked out like over an hour's worth of really meaningful conversation where people will actually be able to learn something about you and like you know i think it was it ended up being really good and i appreciate your time thank you very much for thinking of me and letting and, and uh including me and uh and uh challenging me with some good questions i appreciate your, uh, <laughs> I appreciate appreciate your, your continued patience with my existence here on the <laughs> out on the, the other end of the camera so uh, uh, well, you've always been one you. of my favorite illustrators and i absolutely have always adored your work and you know it was so much different than what i was doing and uh, you know, and, and it was like, just, you know, sometimes when somebody's doing something that's different than what you're doing, it can be extremely inspirational. Like you were saying, like, you know, like some of the dark art that you follow on Instagram, that's so different than what you do. But, you know, we, you know, one of the things that's underestimated about what we do is all day, every day, we have to pull things out of our mind that, that don't exist. You know, and it's like people underestimate how exhausting that is and how much effort it takes. And people, you know, it, it tends to be like, oh, you're lucky you have a fun job. You get to draw these little things all day. And it's like it's a job like any other job. And it's and it can be very difficult. And so anywhere that people get to refill their bucket, uh, I think is like extremely important, whether, you know, whether it's like watching the skateboarding for a couple hours one day because that refill some part of your creative juices that you may not directly use, but helped you get things fired. You know what I mean? Like wherever yeah. it comes from, I think it's important. Yeah. And, um, and so, yeah, like the difference between like my death metal art in the two thousands and like your, you know, kind of indie rock, you know, squirrels and spacesuits is like, <laughs> I think I, you know, it was important to me to be able to refuel some of my stuff off of your work. And, you know, I always appreciated that about, about you as a person that you are also, you know, we've been friends for a long time and we have, a, you know, we have that relationship and it's, yeah. it's cool to talk to you and I'm glad you're well and, you know, say hi to your wife for me too. Thank you very much. I will do so. Thank you very much for setting a good example as far as your your masterful professionalism and what you do and uh, and in uh, bringing people together with this uh, with your podcast here. Oh, thank so. you. I appreciate thank it. Thank you, sir.